Hello, everyone. My name is Chris Lamera. I'm a programmer at the American Cinematheque, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to our virtual panel focusing on Black identity through television. Today, we have five amazing panelists joining us today to discuss their unique perspectives uh, working within the television industry. Uh, before we introduce them, I just want to thank our wonderful co-presenters, the African American Film Critics Association, uh, who made this event possible. Uh, today's panel is a follow-up to our Black Identity Through Cinema panel that we had last fe February. Uh, so I just want to extend a special thanks to the president of AFCA, Gil Robertson, uh, for collaborating with us to bring this second edition. So thank you all for tuning in. I'd like to now turn it over to Gil, who will be moderating the conversation. Thanks, Chris. Hi, everyone. Uh, well, I don't need to introduce myself, uh, but I will again. I'm Gil Robertson, president of the African American Film Critics Association. And we are thrilled to uh, welcome a uh, very group, uh, exciting group of uh, creatives uh, who are going to talk about how Black identity is represented in television, uh, starting with Steve Canals, uh, the creator of the hit show Pose. Welcome, Steve. Thank you for having me. Uh, Sierra Glaude, a, a showrunner on Queen Sugar. What's happening, guys? Little Marvin, who recently uh, ran up the, to the top of the charts with them on Amazon. <laughs> Patrick wow. Ian Polk, who continues to amaze. Uh, his latest uh, project is Pea Valley on Stars. Oh. <laughs> and last but certainly not least, the very talented uh, dear friend Stephanie Elaine, who has worked in front of, behind the camera, and is responsible for uh, a many, many, many careers uh, in this industry. Oh, thanks, Gil. Hi, everybody. So let's go out, let's get off to the races here. Uh, I'll start with you, Steve, since you're right to my left. Uh, tell us about, you know, Pose, why it was important for you to make the show. Uh, specifically, you know, obviously dealing with, uh, you know, these storylines that were very specific to uh, the Afro-Latino experience. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, there's a, it's a multi-layered response. Um, I think one is that I, I grew up in housing projects in the Bronx in the 1980s um, and felt that it was critically important for me to tell the story, not only of my people, but of my community you know, we were, we were the forgotten, we were the overlooked. And the reality is that our story really has never been told by us. And it certainly hasn't been told for us, you know, more often than not, um, you know, I think BIPOC folks stories live and are rooted in their trauma. And so for me, it was like, I wanted to center the joy that can come out of any environment, even one where we have no resources at our disposal. Um, and so that was the beginning of it. I think that as a lover and a consumer of, of television and of content, um, I never saw a family that looked like mine because the reality is I grew up in a very mixed family of um, white passing Latinos Afro Latinos and then non-Hispanic Black people. And so my family was very, very, very mixed, you know, and I just, I never saw that before. It feels like, you know, I mean, and obviously this gets us into a much more complicated conversation around, you know, colorism and, and those racial and ethnic dynamics. But the reality is like, especially for me as an Afro Puerto Rican, it's like those identities are always split, right? It's like, you never get to see all of that living within one person. And you certainly don't see that within a character on television. Um, and then finally, I think particularly as a queer person, my, my lived history is lost. You know, it just, it, we, I have to seek out my knowledge and, and I have to seek out history um, about my people. And when I think about queerness and how it is represented in a black or a brown body on television, it's funny that Patrick Ian Polk is here today because you know, he created this really beautiful show called Noah's Ark. And that really kind of really begins and ends there. <laughs> you know, I really can't think of another show as an adult. Um, I suppose DL Chronicles is another um, where I was seeing a positive representation of Black or Latin queerness. Um, and so those were all of the things that were happening at the same time when I decided to write that first draft of Pose. 
Yeah, and I noticed that. I was like, God, we have uh, both Stephen and Patrick. So we definitely have uh, the LGBTQ community uh, as strong. So I'm and, very, and, very... Uh, and me. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, <laughs> We are we are representing today, all of us. Well, see, wait, wait, Stephanie can represent the straights today. <laughs> A lot of heavy lifting to do wait, over there. Finally in the majority, right? <laughs> uh, Sierra, talk about, um, you know, Queen Sugar tells the story of an all-American family, a Black all-American family you know, living out on their family farm that they've owned for generations in Louisiana, which uh, is my uh, my home state. And uh, Stephanie's rooted down there too, as are quite a few Blacks who live in LA. But talk about, you know, how you've gone, you know, what went into your putting together um, those storylines that are complex, that are interesting, but that are, are, are filled with, fullness and richness mm -hmm. and three-dimensional character characters and not just relying on stereotypes and tropes um yeah so um I actually didn't I'm not a writer so I actually didn't do much but I will say on season three when Kat uh Candler was the showrunner she called me the authenticator because I came out to LA and I was in the writer's room and I was um you know I was their point person because I was the most country person in the room and we had a lot of new kids that season. And so Kat wanted the, you know, it to feel authentic and stuff like that. So I actually um, got a lot of lines in that season and stuff like that. And I got some in season two because Ava would hear me just say all of these country quips and be like, that's got to go in there. And so like, um, what was special about that is like me having that Southern background, like that's why, you know, they would reach out to me for these things and be like, you know, is this real? And I'd be like, yes or no. I'm like, or let's, you know, do it this way or, you know, just provide them with like different Southern perspectives and things like that. And it's, it's just very much a, a family environment. And so um, for those that don't know, I actually started on Queen Sugar season one as the first team PA. Season two, I was the first team PA and I made a, a film in between. And then season three, I was the writer's PA. So I got me some lines in, you know what I'm saying? Um, and season four, I had my little thesis year and season five, I returned as a director. And so I got to direct three episodes um, of season five, which was really dope. Cause that's when we were doing um, the COVID storylines and Ava rewrote the whole thing, um, you know, to fit the times. and you know, we were just living in the moment and recreating the moment and preserving the moment. And, you know, we couldn't have done that without, you know, our family roots and stuff down there. So, um, yeah, you know. Family. I mean, talk about how your Southern background, you're from Alabama. Yeah, I'm from right uh, down the street from um, uh, New Orleans. I'm about like an hour and a half, two hours east in Mobile, Alabama. Um, so, you know, born and raised down there, you know what I'm saying? Um, AKA right down the street from Chuck and Lisa Patrick, you know what I'm saying? So um, we, will seeing, we will be seeing you soon as you come to direct your episode. Yes, hey, I'm so excited. Um, that was a soft, um, that was a soft break in that story because nobody knows, but I'm very uh, excited. And also uh, real quick, Steven, you and the Pose family have my heart. Um, Truly, I'd be laughing, crying, shouting, screaming, but um, sorry, back to Queen Sugar. So, um, yeah, no, no, yeah, no, yeah, no. Talk about, you know, talk about, the talk about we just about made too. So, you know, I mean, talk about the work you're going to be doing on P Valley, too. I mean, what I think we really want to get into is as a southerner, mm -hmm. uh, because you and Patrick, I believe, have the unique distinction of being the only two southerners on you know, you were born and bred in the south. Mm -hmm. How does that experience inform your work as a director, as a creative? Um, honestly, I feel like really new to this because growing up as a gay black girl in the South, I did not know like the film industry existed. Like, I guess I would see movies and stuff like that, but I was outside playing, you know, riding horses, riding dirt bikes on the boat, you know, doing stuff like that. And so you put on a movie or something, I was going to sleep. And so it wasn't until like later, you know, um, in like late high school, college, I started getting into it. And so I feel like I'm still just kind of still developing my style because, you know, I'm just new to the game. People are like, oh, you seen this old movie, this, this, that, and the third? I'd be like, no. And so I feel like I have like a freshness to it because I ain't trying to copy nobody. I ain't got nobody's, you know, things to go up against. I'm just out there like, you know, following my heart and doing what I feel and trusting my team and stuff like that. And so just, again, bringing those personal experiences of, you know, just being in the South and having that 
you know, I got a lot of cousins and stuff like that. And, you know, just like real big, like tight knit family. So it's really nice to be able to like bring that experience and authenticate experiences and like queen sugar and stuff like that. We had a scene one time that cat was shooting and Aunt Violet was coming in the door. And I, and I was just a PA at this time. It was like season two. And I ran up to cat. I said, cat, before you punch in on this, I said, Violet needs to walk in and close that door because as a black girl from the South, all I can think about is all the mosquitoes coming in the door. And so she went and closed the door for, you know, little things like that, just to keep going. Yeah, Patrick, build upon that as a Southerner. I mean, talk about the Southern nuance that you bring to these, these stories. Well, um, I mean, I'm from um, those little details. I'm from practically the same place. Um, so I'm from Southern Mississippi, Hattiesburg, and a lot of my family uh, in Mobile and my father's family uh, in Baton Rouge. So yeah, no, I'm definitely Southern. Um, I mean, it's, it's kind of like the same thing as Shooter, but you know, decades earlier, um, you know, growing up in the South, kind of not really understanding that, you know, queerness was not something that that could be publicized and talked about. But at the same time, having sort of somehow the wherewithal to understand that it was OK. Um, so I was just focused on kind of like biding my time till I could get out of the South, which I did as soon as I graduated high school. Um, but and so it really was about by that time for me, I had discovered, you know, this is what I want to do. Filmmaking, Spike Lee, you know, was the big influence that that sort of taught me because I knew nothing about the industry. Um, and I think there's this thing, you know, Stephen kind of talked about it a little bit. It's when you come from the outside, like really far from the outside of the industry, there is a sort of um, audacity, you know, that comes from ignorance of, of the system and, and the, the status quo, um, but just this desire to tell stories. So for me, it's, it's been interesting to move away from the South, acclimate to Hollywood and the lifestyle and, and that be my life as an adult, but then continuously kind of coming back to, as I get older and older, coming back to the South, coming back to the South from, um, you know, I did a film Blackbird here in Mississippi with Monique and Isaiah Washington playing the parents of this, you know, gay teen um, coming up in the church and shot it in my hometown in Mississippi. So, and then from that to Pea Valley, which is like, again, born and bred in, it could not be more black and more Mississippi. So it's just sort of like this interesting time to me where all of this stuff is happening and all of this queer stuff is happening and all these queer storytellers are getting their day. Um, and everything from like a, a show that has been so embraced by the mainstream black community as P Valley. And again, could not, I mean, what Katori is doing on that show is pushing the envelope even, even further in terms of black LGBTQ, you know, representation. So it's an interesting time for us. Um, but uh, I, I, I still, Stephen touched on this, you know, Noah's Ark, pose there's still been so little of really 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 diving into you know the community um and, and we're going to get to that uh, as we uh dig a little deeper 20s as well i want to mention lena in 20s mm -hmm. so yeah and like you said it's it's the audacity of like coming from those places and just kind of like having like a little bit of a disregard for the system anyway and just being like i'm gonna do me and you either gonna like it or you're gonna love it and i'm not gonna care either way because i'm gonna keep it pushing I learned that from Spike, directly from Spike Lee. Mm -hmm. Reading, and my mother gave me, she's got to have it, because I asked for a video, a VHS video camera for Christmas, and she gave me that, that book, and it changed my life. I knew what film school was. I knew what by any means necessary was. Like, it literally, that was, that, that, that's what taught me and, and enabled me to then go on and create some stuff like Punks and Noah's Ark, which just, there's no reason that, that those shows and that, that work should exist, because nobody in Hollywood was checking for that. So it really was like clawing and scratching and making it happen by any sort of way and look and all that. So, you know, it's love to see, lovely to see Steven and Sierra, you know, doing the, the big things. Lena, Justin, you know. I just got off of 20s too, and that was fire. So 
had a blast with that. Like you said, it's just so lovely to just see us all out here. And then, you know, we just gonna multiply. Now, little Marvin, um, I mean, you know, your them dealt with a, a real issue that uh, uh, minority communities, certainly uh, black communities have had to deal with uh, since, you know, um, since we got here, really the discriminatory practices that, you know, that govern housing and that ultimately define, um, you know, generational wealth. Uh, talk about, you know, your experiences and what led you to this, this important project and topic. Much like every answer here, it's it's pretty multi-layered. Um, I would say I want to speak to the audacity thing because I mean I just I'm so proud to be on this panel with these people, um, Patrick. We're, we're getting there. We go get there. I mean, so I mean it's 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 an honor to really to be here. Um, uh, but the a certain level of desperation can also breed audacity. <laughs> I am not a child, as you can see here, and I I've wanted this for a very very long time, and I. I I tried to do it with some gusto when I got out of college, but it was not enough gusto. It was, uh, and and so I kind of have this wonky path where this was always my dream. I've loved storytelling since I was a kid. I've always been secretly writing and squirreling away characters and plots and storylines forever. And then by day, I was making my living as a marketing executive and as a creative director for many, many years. And I always thought that never the two shall meet was my thing. I'm like, okay, I'll just write for me, but by day, I'm pitching to executives, I'm doing post-production process, I'm overseeing production, I'm, and then there was this magical moment where in my head I'm like, well, wait a minute, <laughs> I'm doing all of this by day, I'm writing by night, I was also looking at what showrunners do, I was watching panels like this every single night that I could get my hands on, and I'm like, it seems to me that showrunners do exactly what I've been doing, and that was like a light bulb uh, moment for me, and so desperation uh, at a certain level got me out, but in terms of this particular storyline and this particular show, uh, there's a few things that kind of came together. I've loved horror. I've been a horror genre buff since I was a kid, but I've always been rather disappointed with how underrepresented we have been. I mean, we're just beginning to, and it's lovely, but for many, many years, we were not. We were never centered in those narratives. When I think of my favorite films, The Shining, The Exorcist, Rosemary's Baby, these movies I've loved my entire life, folks who look like us never occupied the center of those frames. We were always the friend, we were the, the, the elevator boy, we were the, the shoeshine boy, we we're all everything else but the star. And so I knew that the first thing I made, I wanted to center us in those kinds of narratives. It was also coming from a place of feeling a lot of terror. I was waking up every day, looking at my phone like folks do and scrolling through video after video after video of black folks being terrorized in some capacity. And it got me thinking a lot about a history of that terror and a history of living under that gaze for many, many, as you say, since we got here. Um, so that sort of brew of, of wanting to interrogate the roots of that terror and wanting to center a Black family in the kinds of narratives I love and desperation <laughs> came together to create this show. Well, you're doing a great job. So, you know, congrats. <laughs> Thank you. I'm an American cinema tech. I'm with you. I'm with them. I am very, very honored and, and very, I'm nerding out right now. I don't know if you can tell. It's a big no, you're doing just fine. <laughs> Stephanie, uh, talk about, I mean, your experience both, uh, you know, on both, on all sides, really. Uh, um, and what grade you would give the industry in terms of, uh, um, putting uh, the, oh, their openness to to a greater uh, diversity in terms of just storylines uh, featuring Black people. Hey guys, yeah, well, I have been at this a minute, <laughs> I think 30 years, it's a long time. Um, and, and that scope has really given me the opportunity to see the ebbs and flows of, of who we are and how we participate and create in the industry. Um, I'm so impressed with all of you and just, just the multitude of voices, the nuance of voices that we have. I would say halfway there, you know what I mean? I would say halfway. I feel like there's so much more, but I can say that, you know, when I started with Boys in the Hood, which was 1991, um, and in the 90s, for the most part, there's always outliers, but for the most part, the industry, was interested in the portrayals of us as gangsters, 
or comics or, you know, fat men in, in dresses, you know, or like there, there was this thing that they, they craved and to work, we gave it to them. You know what I'm saying? Um, but that played out. It was just became tropes. It just became the same old thing. And so then there was a dearth. There was not much happening. And then the rise out of that has been this multitude of, of, of characters and characterizations and voices. So I'm super duper excited. You know, I've, I'm always, I think, like um, Patrick and Lil Marvin were talking about, you know, the beginner's mind is a beautiful thing. You know, it, 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 it's so empty and it's so, you can fill it up with such freshness. And that's what's always attracted me from Singleton to, to uh, Justin, to just a, a lot of different voices that have come into the business and just said, hey, this is who I am. This is what I want to talk about. So I'd say halfway there. You know, we got to, hopefully we'll get we'll get uh, like 75, 80, 90 percent there before I, I lay down my 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 baton. But, um, you know, we're in, we're in good times. And so we should we should celebrate. Now, would each of you say that television offers a greater range of freedoms and opportunities to to express our diversity than film? Um, I don't know. I mean, given the budgets and given the timelines, of, I mean, you know, it's kind of leaning towards television, but what has been your experience? I mean, I think so. Um, just, you know, after Noah's Ark, um, you know, I didn't get work in television, um, not at all. So I went off and made two independent films. And then the, by that, in, in those sort of five, six years, the sea had started to change. I had moved to New York and a writer friend of mine, Nicole Jefferson Asher, who created um, Self Made with Octavia on Netflix. She said to me once when I was in LA visiting, you know, if you were living, do you want some advice? Because as an independent filmmaker making black gay shit, you know, the, the residuals are like steadily drying up and getting less and less. And it was getting to that point where like you take a day job or you figure something out. And she said to me, you know, do you want some advice? If you were living in LA today, you'd be working in television. And it clicked. And, you know, I got an agent, I got on being Mary Jane, and I haven't stopped working since. And it just, that would not have, that did, that did not happen after Noah's Ark. It just did not happen on any level. A, because the shows weren't out there. There was no being Mary Jane and P-Valley and The Shy, all of the shows I've worked on you know, all created by, you know, these black women. Um, so it all rolls along, you know, it, it's definitely, and the explosion in, you know, streaming and everything. So it's just it's much more opportunity and you can have a director, a black gay director or Lee Daniels producing or like all these sort of people creating or a Sierra directing. And then you have people like Katori and myself and, Lil Marvin who, and Lena, who are in positions to hire this gay person, that gay person, and Steven, who's able to put all these, you know, black and brown trans women on TV. And it's just, you know, all, and then the you- House of Abundance. And you know what I mean? It's just bills and bills and bills, and it's all over, and we have tentacles everywhere now. And that's what's really cool. And I think it is because there's just a lot more opportunity because there are a lot more, there's a lot more competition, a lot more outlets. So yeah, for me, it's definitely more TV over film. Well, yeah, cause I've also never, I haven't done a film yet, but like what I have been enjoying about doing these different shows is go, like being able to drop into these different stories that I love. I love Queen Sugar cause you know, I'm from the South and I love my family. I love twenties because I'm in my twenties or late twenties, I hear it, you know, doing the thing as a, as a gay black woman out in Hollywood and then going to P Valley I got experience there too, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, I get to jump into all of these things. So for right now, it's TV for me until I can go do a film. And I don't want to do a film until I got some say so and I can do it how I want and make what we need to see and you know, what my heart wants to put out there. Stephanie, what are your thoughts about uh, the window of opportunity that uh, television offers creatives? I, I agree with Patrick. I, I think that 
it just opened up a whole lot of other avenues for people. The streaming, the 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 the, the gluttony for content has 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 made space for us, you know. And I think I think that's great, you know. And also, film is. Um, you know, we've just been grappling with this for so long. It's just that to get the budget for a film with black faces, brown faces, you know, there's just still, there's a zero in for overseas, you know, money, which helps fund it. And because the DVD market dried up a long time ago, there's just, there's no other way to get your money back. And the lack of theaters and the preponderance of people at home. You know, I got a great system at home to watch movies. You know, I'm going to have to really be motivated to go out and watch a movie now. I'm just, and I'm a film lover, but that's just how it is, you know, and especially now with the, with the variant and everything happening. So I think that, um, and, and, and as Sierra was saying, like just what Ava did with bringing on so many women to, to direct that show, you know, just created a marketplace. I mean, as a, as a producer, as an executive producer right now, it's so hard to find a black woman who's not working, you know? It's amazing, but it's really frustrating. Um, so I think that 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 says that we're that TV has really uh, opened up a lot of possibilities. Well, specifically to Patrick and to Stephen, but certainly everyone can uh, chime in. Why has it taken so long to? I mean, there have been you know black gay people uh, as long as there have been people, but yet these storylines have been missing. Uh, you 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 know from from popular television. Uh, what do you think? Um, yet you see portrayals of white, you know, uh, you know, diverse sexual diversity all the time. So, what do you think that's all about? And uh, racism. Okay, I was gonna hop out to say, oh, call it what it is. <laughs> But talk about talk about some of those conversations with executives, uh, you know, as you've gone into, you know, pitch these projects and some of the resistance and obstacles, you know, that you've had to overcome to get that green light. Stephen, I don't know if we have enough time, but in, in the cliff note version, <laughs> it was the breaths for me. Um, you know, uh, and I've talked about this publicly quite a bit. You know, there were I had one hundred and sixty seven meetings in this industry prior to meeting Ryan Murphy, who after 45 minutes said, I'm going to help you. We're going to get this show made, um, you know, and then goes back to FX and is like, this is the show that we're going to invest in. Give it the money that it needs. You know, let's put this on air. Um, the the so ultimately it took another gay person someone from the LGBT community to get it. Although I imagine in all of those meetings, you probably were talking to executives who were, but Ryan being such a unique, you know, and singular force, it took Absolutely. someone like him. You know, and, and I think that there's more to unpack there because obviously we're also talking about a really powerful cisgendered white man. Um, and so there is this additional layer that, you know, as a you know, as a person of color, that I had to align with someone white to even get to a place where anyone would decide to be invested in this particular story. Um, the vast majority of the here's the truth of those 167 meetings. On two hands, I probably could name the number of executives that I met with who weren't white. You know, the vast majority were, and they were straight, and they were cisgendered. And so the narrative that I was hearing over and over again when I was pitching the show is. I don't know who the audience is for a show like this. I don't know where a show like this lives. Um, you know, this is a very risk averse industry. Um, and so now being on the other side of it, I understand, I don't agree with it, but I understand why at that point in my career where I'd only been staffed on a show, why someone would not want to give me you know, or why someone would want to give me rather millions of dollars to go make a television show. You know, it's like, I don't have a proven track record. And the reality is, you know, the studios and the networks, they want to know that they're going to get their money back. They want to know that you are going to take them to the finish line. The, the sad part of it is that this business is a business. And so it isn't really about the work. You know, I think for 
Patrick Nian and myself and Little Marvin, for all of us, I think the reality is like we're creating work because we want to be seen, we want to be centered, we know that these stories have importance, we know the value um, that this is going to have for young Black kids out in the world, that this is going to have for young brown kids out in the world to see themselves represented fully. I don't really think that the industry cares that much about it. You know, no, it's, the truth is, it's why I have a hard time patting myself on the back when it comes to Pose, because on one end, personally, I'm really proud of being one of the architects of a show that has centered Black and Afro-Latin trans women. And at the same time, I know that that has nothing to do with why this show got greenlit. I don't, you know, it's, it's sad to say it out loud, but I don't think that the vast majority of folks who um, who are proud of the show now, you know, it's like my memory is long. I know who those 167 meetings were where they said no and what they were saying behind closed doors. So the reality is I'll publicly, you can, you know, give me all of the praise and you can talk about how groundbreaking the show is. But the reality is when it came down to it, you were not invested in me or this story, you well, know, so. And it's not even, it's not even, I mean, Gatekeepers are so important. I knew I knew that. I saw that from being one of the gatekeepers and and understanding what you want to push forward is what you know and what you love and what you understand. But let's be clear. It's not even about the money. Like they're leaving $10 billion on the table every year, according to McKenzie, this report that that we commissioned from the Black Light Collective, which is basically just a group of, you know, black. Black execs and producers and, and agents who got together after George Floyd and said, what, what can we do? How can we get our stories out? Because we know our stories humanize us and that changes policy. That changes the way that we can interact in the world. And yet after the report came out, it was in the New York Times, $10 billion left on the table. We were like, oh, we got these results. Oh, this is gonna be great. This is gonna change everything, you know? $10 billion left on the table, so what? That's, that's basically what the industry's response was. So that's why I call it racism because that's the only reason why our stories aren't, you know, just sought after and pushed and, 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 and produced and marketed and sold. That's the only reason. I'm with you. Particularly when they perform so well, when given those opportunities. Yeah. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's amazing. That's what's so frustrating because you think, oh, Hollywood's green. You know what I mean? But it's not, it's not all the way green. There's some and other that, agendas at play too. Can I say, I also think that, and I don't know, Patrick Ian, I don't know how you feel about this, but it, when I think about specifically when we're talking about in television, black content, right? And the fact of the matter is, I don't think it's by chance that in one season you had Insecure, you had Atlanta, you had Blackish, like you had all, like there was this deep proliferation of Black content. And I am specifically citing those shows because other than finding an audience and becoming big hits, they also were awards bait, right? All of those shows were being nominated for. Emmy Awards for Golden Globes, for Critics' Choice Awards. And so for as Afcos. a result, say it again. <laughs> for Af for Afcos. <laughs> yeah. And so I think suddenly now, right, it's like everyone perks up and the industry is paying attention and saying, well, maybe we have to do more programming like that. But I, you know, the reality is like this isn't the first time that we saw this boon. You know, it's like that was happening in the 90s with black content as well. And then it just went away. Right. It's just suddenly it was like, where where did we go? Like everyone just suddenly disappeared. Um, and so now you've seen in this era where we have, you know, streaming and there's so many more places for content to live. And those shows now have exploded. Now we're seeing more content again, you know, and now you're seeing people like Lena and Justin and like all these folks are now getting overall deals. And now they, you know, they have, there's more of an investment in the story, but I would say, I think it's deeper than just, and I, th I think Stephanie just spoke to this. It's like, it's so much more than just, oh, we, we feel it's important to center these narratives. It's oh, also it's not that at all. getting out of it. You know, the reality is it's making you money. It's getting you awards for your network. And that to me, I think has in some ways more value than what the work itself is gonna do for the community. Stephanie, you wanna comment? No, I'm, I'm sorry to be so cynical. I, I just been around so long, I guess, <laughs> you know, um, 
Is but, it cynical or real? Yeah, maybe it's just real. Maybe it's just real. I, 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 don't, I don't see any head of any studio doing something because it's the right thing to do. You know, I just, I've, I've never seen it. It's like, we want to make it make sense. They want to make it make dollars and cents. Mm. And, and sometimes not even dollars and cents. You know what I mean? Sometimes it's just, it's just this ingrained sense of, of what they think people want to see. You know what I mean? That, that uh, only based on what they want to see. I mean, it could be that they're writing an agenda or trying to, uh, you know, perpetrate a certain status quo, you know, is what I've always thought about some of the I mean, decisions I mean, you see being made. The truth is, I think I really spend so little time thinking about them, not your show. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, like, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> I, just, I just really try to think about who's next. You know what I mean? Like what voice needs to be told? Like who needs who needs to be, you know, pushed up into the limelight? Because just the more those voices out there, the cacophony of the individual voices is the thing that changes culture. And I so, so believe that. And uh, I think that's all we can really do because otherwise it's, woof, it just gets into, you know, second guessing and this and that, and, you know, trying to change people's, you know, hearts and minds, which the only way you could do that is with incredible content, you know, that moves people, that humanizes us. And that's, that's the game, I think, is just to keep pushing, keep pushing. Patrick? Um, yeah, I mean, what happened in the, you know, in the 90s, I guess from the 80s into the 90s was you had, it, again, it was a very small market. You had three networks. And then as the, the network started to grow, the way they would grow is by doing, oh, we have to do what the other three aren't doing, which is black programming. So you had Fox, which in the beginning was doing all this black programming until they you know, built an audience and then they slowly started to abandon that black programming. And then you had the WB or whatever, and they did the same thing. Um, and it's sort of like what Stephanie alluded to with the hood movies, where they just kind of mine a genre, a moment for all that they can, they squeeze the life out of it and then it gets stale and old and then they move on to you know, more white stuff. And so that's what continued to happen. But now we have all these outlets. So it's just like everyone has to compete with everyone. And, and, and the fact of the matter is, you know, people of color are a market. And, and, and as, much as, they, as much as they don't recognize it, as much as they recognize, you know, the quote unquote mainstream market, they do recognize it. Um, so, I mean, it's still tricky. It's still kind of, we need more people of color in those positions of power because what ends up happening is if you're lucky enough to get a champion, you know, in the upper ranks of a network or whatever, right? By the time you, you know, all the hoops that they make people of color jump through, the years it takes to develop your show and get it on the air, um, by that time, your champions have moved on to other jobs, have been replaced, and then you're dealing with, you know, new heads of the network that don't get your show. And so, you know, then what do you do? Um, you know, and that's kind of a thing that Katori and that we went through on P Valley, um, where it took way longer than it should have to get that show on the air. Um, and then you dealing with 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 white executives and people who don't get it, who just now, oh, we didn't really this wasn't our show and we don't really get it. Um, and it wasn't until P Valley came out and like blew the ratings out of the roof for stars that they were like, oh, shit. Oh, now we have something. It's like, I mean, quiet as it's kept, you know. I mean, you would think, given the success they had with Tyler's stuff, Lionsgate, that it would have been easy to understand. It all boils down to who is sitting in the chairs at the top. And they're not, they're not tuned into like a P Valley or even Tyler Perry, other than he's just making a shit ton of money. They're not tuned into that. You know what I mean? So it really is about. You know, you you have to be so lucky and so in the right thing and so get the right kind of people. And even then you're still fighting to like keep it going and make it happen. It's I could, you know, I can only imagine what Steven went through. Um, there are three seasons of Pose. I can only imagine what 
little Marvin and Lena went through to get them on the air. Like, I don't know those stories, but I can imagine because we all we all go through that even today, even with the successes that we have out there. It's still really hard. Oh, yeah. One more question up to you, Steve, uh, Steve, then I'm going to hit you, little Marvin. The same question as it applies to Afro Latinos, because you never, you know, you never see those the, those faces that are a part of our community. You never see the Dominican. You never see the Colombian, the Brazilian, the C Cuban. I mean, oh, blacks are overwhelmingly, you know, uh, on that island. Live on that island. Um, why that erasure? Why do you think that uh, up until this point, uh, television creatives haven't been more forthcoming with those uh, with that reality? Um, because they're anti-black. <laughs> that was okay we're doing straight up answers today right <laughs> um i mean i think there, there isn't any other yeah i don't have a more uh, nuanced answer other than um just look at program most latinx programming right it tends to center folks who are white passing you know, very fair skin and light hair and light eyes. Unless and, you're Celia Cruz. Unless you're Celia Cruz, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like you don't often see the full scope um, of the Latinx community, you know. Um, and so that's that's disappointing and that's sad. And again, I think, you know, it's, it's not representative of, certainly not of my family, and it definitely isn't representative of the community that I grew up in the Bronx. You know, it was like, it really was much more diverse and and the latinx community in my neighborhood was much more black than white and so you know but again i think it's i can speak specifically within the latinx community that anti-blackness runs rampant it is it's very strong and i think that nobody wants proximity to blackness you know they they don't period you know and so as a result it makes sense to me that those are not the narratives and those are not the lives that have been centered. Um, and it's interesting, I think, just to, to go even further and to continue to just speak transparently, um, interesting to think about when Pose first came out because you know, the, our, our lead character played by MJ Rodriguez, who is a black Puerto Rican trans woman um, is playing an Afro-Latina trans woman on television. Um, and in the beginning, like our first season, where we were being completely embraced by, by most black outlets and critics, like we were completely ignored by the Latinx community. And it really wasn't wow. until, I don't think it wasn't until the Imagen Awards um, that then suddenly I think people were paying attention. I think there was like a little bit of notice because they were like, oh, there's an Afro Puerto Rican at the center of creating the show. But in terms of the content of the show, like, I, I don't think that many Latinx people saw the show as speaking to them. Yeah, I was there that night, I remember. It was a slow burn. It took a yeah. while for, I think, the community to sort of pay attention and say, oh, you know, and, I, and obviously there's other complications outside of these women being, you know, intersectional, being both Black and Latin, but I think it's also that they're, our show centers queer and trans people. And I think the minute that you add that additional identity on top of being uh you know black and latin it's just it, it just breaks people's brain <laughs> yeah we could literally dig into that uh for a long long time but we'll have a part three of this conversation so little marvin i mean is what they're saying is true i mean what's happening you know post them or i mean what has the industry reaction been to uh this piece of work which certainly uh you know gained the attention of a wide, you know, swath of viewers. It was, uh, you know, more than um, uh, was talked about, you know, uh, what's happening now? T tell us, what are your experiences like post them? <laughs> I'll tell you with what little brain I have left <laughs> being on the other side of that storm. Everyone sitting here has, has experienced it. I, I, I know this is very new to me because this was my first this is my very first um, television show. And not only my first television show, but this was my first experience in TV, period. I'd never stepped foot in a writer's room. I never worked for anybody else in TV. Like I wrote a show 
Stop showing off. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Sorry. No, but I, I hope it doesn't sound that way. But it really is like it was. It, I think it's unique in the sense that like I, I, I had never done it, and then, and then I was the showrunner and the executive producer of this thing, so it was a lot and, um, um, and and tremendous. Uh, I, the response has been phenomenal. I mean, in the sense that like it was the show was a hit, and and I will say that like what really is humbling and heartening to me has been have been the sort of the notes and messages and letters from folks you know around the world who have felt seen and heard by the show i think you realize very quickly oh that's why i'm doing it <laughs> when when someone says oh this happened to my auntie when she moved here or this happened to my grandparents when they moved there or this happened to my family when we moved into x neighborhood in the 80s you realize very quickly like oh like to be seen and to be heard is is why you do what you do so it's been phenomenal in that sense i mean there's so much I want to say about there literally could be three hours based on what everyone has said. I think what Stephanie has said about um, just staying relentlessly focused on your voice and on the stories you want to tell. Yes, it's hard. <laughs> yes, it's challenging. But I can tell you, having been in the 90s, in the late 90s, early 2000s, when I first took my little stab at trying to do exactly this and all i was told was we want a black version of this or we want friday or we want this movie and i knew i was not giving any of that so i had talked myself into believing for nearly two decades that this would be an impossible career for me that i would never find a space for the kinds of weird strange out there stories i wanted to tell with folks who look like me in them and then you fast forward and I have to say, I'm sitting here, I'm not meaning to sound Pollyanna, but it is exciting. I, I don't want folks who are watching this, who are perhaps trying to get in to lose the sense that the most important thing is staying relentlessly focused <laughs> on your peculiar voice. If I hadn't done that, I wouldn't be sitting with these amazing folks. So yes, it's challenging. Yes, I agree with Stephanie. We're not even halfway there, I think, in terms of where we can be. But my gosh, has it changed in the last 15 years? I mean, what I would have thought was impossible is now here. So I don't know what I'm even answering at this point, other than to say, like, I'm just trying to like remember all the little bits and pieces people have said that I've wanted to respond to. Look, I'm older than all you guys. And I grew up on, you know, the TV I grew up on was Petticoat Junction. I dream of Jeannie, you know what I'm saying? Like, like Green Acres, there was nobody. When Julia happened, we were like, holy smokes, what is this show? You know what I mean? So we have come a long way, baby. You know what I mean? Like we should be celebrating that. So I appreciate that, Lil Marvin, it's true. Now, are you, and, and, and things are different today. I mean, you have, you know, you know, Ava, you know, building Array, you have Patrick, you have a production a company. You know Anthony Hemingway. You have Macro uh, working at it from all sides. Um, uh, Will Packer, uh, Shondaland. I mean, mean, you know, so you do have some shot callers now, some legitimate shot callers now. Uh, you know, Ryan Coogler has has disproven you know a lot of naysayers about the popularity, the true popularity of our of our stories. Um, is this going to stick this time? I mean, where do you see us going? I mean, I feel like it is because like you say, you have people like Ava and stuff like that that's just really out here flooding the industry with, you know, new voices and perspectives. You know, um, I'm speaking from experience. Ask me how I know. But it's just like, you know, she's hiring who she wants to hire. And, you know, look at a right crew um, to everybody listening. If you below the line crew, go to Array Crew right or after we get off this and sign up because you know what I'm saying? Like, that's how we're getting, she's making ways to get in. So it's not just opening doors and windows now. Like, we blowing the roof off this mug. You feel me? And so, like, I feel like- You almost have to because we've, have with, to, yeah. we've been to this, some of us who are a little older have been to this party before and, yeah. you know, it hasn't stuck. But I am hopeful- I feel like if we got something to do with it, it's going to stick. That's just me. I'm you know, you. I may feel I'm a little naive and a little fresh, but that's the mindset I go into it with is like a recklessness and like an unapologeticness because it's just like, I'm going to be me. I don't care what you're doing. Like Tony Moore said, we're going to bring the mainstream over here and you're going to get me how you get me regardless. Like I show up 
the same way whether I'm hanging with my cousins on the porch or if I'm walking into a room greeting Ava and Oprah. Everybody get a what's hound. You feel me? And so it's like, if you just, just keep your foot on the gas, really, you know what I'm saying? And keep opening all these little crevices and, and then we just go build our own house you know, and stuff like that. So um, I'm I'm definitely hoping it'll stick. And, you know, I'm gonna definitely try to do my part to make it stick. And I feel like we have already all, you know, done stuff to, you know, keep it going and we're gonna continue to keep it going. And yeah, we're gonna stick it to them real good this it, time. It has to stick because the stakes are too high. Mm -hmm. You know, when you look at last summer and, you know, everything, all of the aftermath, you know, of George Floyd's murder and, you know, and then Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery and Tony McDade and Laylene Polanco and on and on and on. It's like, we just, we don't have the, the ability to sit back and not continue to unapologetically throw our fists in the air and say, our stories deserve to be told and we're going to continue to persist, period. Yeah. Do changing demographics also factor into this? The fact that this country is increasingly becoming uh, more brown and the fact that because of globalization, um, you know, markets that previously weren't open and that, you know, uh, didn't, weren't, you weren't able to successfully carry a show in Bolivia or in Buenos Aires or in, uh, in, in Namibia and uh, other parts of the world has that created uh, 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 a, a demand? This, has that created, in chasing after those additional uh, numbers, those additional dollars, has that prompted uh, uh, executives to be behind greater diversity in terms of their stories that they're, um, that they're green lighting? I mean, one thing I think is awesome about streaming is that, you know, the, the studios never paid for black actors and, and directors to travel with their movies. So they're like, oh, it's Big Fat Zero, sorry. You know? And now we are all up in everybody's TV all over the world. You know? So to me, that just really portends the building of black talent, and black stars all over the world. I made a movie with Alfre for Netflix called Juanita, quirky little quirky little coming of age you know drama comedy and she was a huge hit in 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 Brazil it was like all of a sudden like Alfre Woodard in Brazil was huge and that's crazy great you know so I think I'm with Sierra it's like we can't depend on what they're going to do or what they're going to say it's like we just have to keep pushing 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 and and use the 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 new technology to really just just invade every every aspect of the business and all over the world. So I think I think that's that's one reason why I don't think we're going anywhere. You know what I mean? Because there's no lid really on how far we can reach, how far our stories can reach. Patrick. Um yes, I think it will stick. Um I I'm encouraged, you know. Um, Lena is a really good example for me just because, you know, when I met her and, you know, she was, she told me how she was inspired by my work and everything. Um, but I met her at a time when I was, you know, as I'm sure Stephanie can attest to in YouTube Gill, you know, it's like when you've been in this as long as we have and, you know, had to kind of like scrape to get through, it's like, just, I met Lena at a time when I was like, you know, a little jaded, a little cynical, and, you know, uh, weary and beaten down by the battle. Um, and I saw in her this very, this fire and this, that, again, that audacity that, you know, Shooter is kind of speaking to. Uh, and it's like the hunger and the, the fearlessness that I'm going to do this. And I remember she was going through it on the shy. And I hope she doesn't mind me telling this story. She's going through it on the shot, like season one, you know, um, because again, of all the things that black creatives have to do that our white counterparts do not have to do, the hoops we have to go through, the people we have to bring onto our show in order to get it made, you know, and she's going through it in that way. And she was like, it's cool though, it's cool. I'm just kind of, I'm just kind of hanging back from this because the, the stuff I'm about to do, like in about a year's time, when I come back, 
like I'm gonna have the power. I'm gonna have all the power. And it was just like amazing to see that all that shit happened within like a year. She did that Steven Spielberg movie. She did this. She boom, 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 and it was she won that Emmy. And you know she reclaimed her show and you know could do it the way she wanted. And then she's doing all these other shows. And then she's got this company that's like employing all these people and bringing all of these young black black voices and brown voices into the writers rooms and directing and all of this stuff you know again just creating opportunities and in a way but again in a way that's very much like bossing up and like i'm owning it you know tyler perry that's another one you know watching a tyler perry happen was just incredible someone who again it's about your voice and being so true to your voice and so focused on your voice and i'm going to do it my way and that insistence and he's you know he's a billionaire and he's got a studio we shot season one of p valley on tyler perry's studio we were one of the first shows there to see all of this this black man created you know it was amazing to to watch and again it's just another avenue that we don't think that we can do that now Tyler Perry has done it. And so there's a black man now in England who's bought some big space and he's building a studio. You know, it's just, there's so much happening and there's so many doors that are open. I am, I am optimistic that it will continue because it's like generational wealth. We're creating, you know, generational careers. I don't know what to call it, but you know what I mean? It's like, it's everywhere. So no, it's, it's, it's right. Like we have second gen, you know, both my kids are in the business. It's like, it, 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 it does when you get there and you hold that door open, it, it can stay open. Yeah. No, you can uh, take it off the hinges. <laughs> Fuck yeah. Oops, sorry. Now, are you, are you <laughs> finding it easier? Because of course, uh, the most, one of the most essential uh, ingredients in this uh, recipe is funding. So has that become easier? You know, finding the, the investment, the, uh, the investors to uh, support these projects and get them up and running. I haven't had to do that, so I'm going to sit this one out. <laughs> I mean, we are seeing some examples through, you know, the work that Macro's doing, uh, you know, you know, Black people, you know, coming together and, and you know, moving these projects along with, with, with seed money and, and funding. Um, but would you agree that that is very critical to the success and longevity of this current movement? Yes. So that's the last hurdle. Because we have the creative muscle, it's clear. We have the understanding of the industry and, and yeah. how it operates. Yeah, I, I will say it's it's a two-handed thing, which is, yes, Macro's awesome, and Lena and Ava and everybody who's got these big companies and they're employing people, um, which is which is fantastic. We but if you don't have any have, money, you don't have, I mean, it's... Well, but beyond that, I've always been an advocate of building our own, but also working within the system at hand. And I think that's where we're still lagging, which is I was an executive 30 years ago, one of the only one or two executives at Columbia Pictures. It's still like that. The gatekeepers are still holding on to those seats. And until that really busts open, like I'm aghast at how many Latino folks are buying tickets and the dearth of Latin content on, on, on the screen. I, I, I feel, I feel what, what can I do? You know what I'm saying? Like, because if you look at black content and Latino content, there's no comparison, you know what I'm saying? And so where are the Latinx executives? Where are they? Like, we need that. And to me, that's the final frontier, which is that the gatekeepers need to look like us too. A thousand percent. Uh, Stephen, what's the final frontier for you? I mean, I co-sign everything that, that has already been said, and I, I agree. I think that the final frontier absolutely lives with, with the gatekeepers being more representative of the world, <laughs> I think, and seeing more people who look like us in those positions of power. You know, it's, it is difficult to be in a position where you are going into a room and you're having to pitch a story and also do the labor of defending the story Ugh. or 
proving yes. why the story has value and why the story has worth or having to find a way to talk about a story in a way that is quote unquote universal. You know, there's like, there's all this coded language that we use in the industry. And the reality is, you know, like universal for who? You know, like that sort of is the, that's the biggest question that I would ask. Or like, you know, I think four quadrant is another one of the terms that we tend to use when we think about content that that is, you know, going to touch everyone. And in reality, it's like, sometimes shows don't need that. I, I would actually assert that we're in a place right now because there is so much content that the modern day audience is very discerning in terms of their tastes and what they're attracted to. And the reality is that niche is the new mainstream. Audiences want specificity. So we should be leaning all the way into the specific. It's everything that Sierra was saying earlier about, you know, and Ann Patrick being from the South and like that then permeates every single frame of the work that they're doing. It's like the reason why those shows are hits now, the reason why people love P-Valley, the reason why people are tuning in for multiple seasons to watch Queen Sugar is because of that specificity. You know, it's why people responded as they did to Pose. It's like, so I don't- That's always that it, been true. That's yeah, always and, been true. So it's odd to me though, that the pushback is, that, I don't know, at least for me, I still, I still feel it, you know, I still have conversations where, you know, we're having to have, uh, where I feel like I'm having to defend. All the time, people. all the time. And you just prove I, why you have a place and why you belong. That's right. exhausting, yeah. And I, I just wanted to bring up this McKenzie report from last year because they looked at the diversity and the inclusiveness among CEOs of, of all industries and of course, the industry that is responsible for culture is the whitest. You know what I'm saying? Like the, the oil, the, the publishing, like all these, other, all these other industries in our country are so much more diverse than the entertainment industry. Mm -hmm. So that's the big stumbling block, which is how do you push past, it, it, it's not about money. It's about, it's about understanding that my story, that Sierra's story, that everybody's story has value and has money value too, you know? Um, that, when, we, when they told us that, I, I was kind of blown away by that. Because you think of the industry as being very diverse and very progressive and very liberal, and yet it's almost 99% white and, and, and male too. Yeah, and like Stephen was saying, it's like, yeah, you gave us the money for it. Yeah, you help us make it. But do you care though? You know what I'm saying? Like, do you really believe in this and like understand and, and see that, you know, I think you said, Stephen, that somebody was like, we don't see where, you know, where this audience lives or, or somebody said that he was like right next door or maybe even in your own house, if you will open your eyes and look. And so it's like, it's not just enough to give us the money for it. It's like, do it again then, keep doing it. You know what I'm saying? Like, show me if you really bought it, like, or if this was just a, a stunt that you pulled to, you know, stay out of hot water or whatever the case. And then, and then the other thing is, when they do give us a shot, if it's not a, a like a a, a a a home run, they're like, oh man, we tried, we tried. But you know? everything they do ain't a home run. Oh, exactly. It's a terrible exactly. double standard. And and yeah. that that care to nurture a show that that maybe doesn't like hit the audience straight up, but then over time can gain the audience. Like we need, we need more of that. And the only way we're gonna get more of that is you have black, brown and LGBTQ people at the table who are fighting for it because they believe in it. I think what you just said, Stephanie, it, it, it makes me think of what we were talking about a little while ago about the importance of seeing more folks like us having seats at those tables. And, and I think it goes beyond just within the industry because you know, go back, what was it, maybe a month ago when In the Heights came out, right? And the numbers weren't what everyone initially projected. And so while it was important for lots of people to see that movie be released and to see themselves beyond just within the Latinx community, the narrative that went out in all of the trades and, and, and being reported in, in the media was it didn't work, yeah. you know? And the reality is like no one else other than us has to deal with you know, if it doesn't work, there's this huge responsibility that we all have to shoulder that now all the other people who are behind the, on the other side of the gate looking to get their shot now possibly won't get one because it didn't work. Yeah. Off with your head. 
Yeah, and it, it you know, it's to me, it's, it's a lot of responsibility. You know what I mean? Like, but it's one that we all carry. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, we all do. What's next for each of you, um, Little Marvin? Oh gosh, um, more. <laughs> love that. Love that. More in a word. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, and across, I mean, it would be, yes, more TV, film, more. More of what? <laughs> Stayed. What's next? What's like immediately next? I can't come on. <laughs> Poor Chris. <laughs> Poor Chris. I'll let you answer that. <laughs> Beyonce. Okay, Beyonce. <laughs> Patrick, what I know you have numerous things in the pipeline. Um uh two more episodes of the shy season four that is um one well two more one this weekend one this weekend um p valley shooting season two right now in the thick of it i we wrapped at 6 a.m this morning <laughs> so i thank you for joining us i know congratulations uh not the whole season just day whatever day this was this is week four i think so we're going to be on it we have, we will be at it the rest of the year but I'm developing um, a comedy series uh, with Gabrielle Union at Showtime. So that's um, that's likely my next gig. And I wrote a movie for uh, a movie for Lifetime, my first TV movie that they're going to make, I think, next year um, as well with Tracy Edmonds producing. Uh, Sierra. All right. So, um, you know, I did my three episodes of Queen Sugar season five. I got one episode in season six that'll be airing this fall. I just finished 20s last week. I did two episodes of that. Um, in a couple of days, I will drive cross country and I will say this because Patrick already said it, but I'm going to do an episode of P Valley, which <laughs> I'm so stoked about. Um, and then I have something, another possible in October for something I dare not say, but you will find out. And yeah, your girl has been booked and busy and I didn't racked up seven, almost eight episodes and I just started last October, so. And you're, a new, member of the, you're a new member of the DGA. I surely am. Welcome, welcome. Yes. yes, they let me in, so I'm up in there. <laughs> <laughs> How old are you? You go to some of the African-American steering committee meetings. How so, old are you, Sierra? I am 29. I will be 30 in September. I was born in 1991. That's amazing. September that what? September 22nd. Okay. Are we birthday twins? I'm the 14th. Okay. Oh my God. Are you got to come to shoot <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, that's what I got up. I'm super excited. And, you know, I feel like I'm just getting warmed up because literally I haven't even been directing TV for a full year. And, you know, um, I got a couple handfuls of episodes. So, yeah, I'm just, you know, foot on the gas. That's I'm just going to tell you when I was in my 20s and that was I was, you know, just fighting so hard trying to get directing gigs. And it was just such so locked down. It was such a white male. Yeah. Just, and it became, it, I've quickly, not quickly, but after a while, just realized how impossible it was to get into a writer's room or it, or get a directing gig. It just, so to see this kind of stuff is really, really yeah, good. And I, well, honestly, I have nobody to thank but Ava. You know what I'm saying? Like, she always put me on the jobs. I was PAing from Queen Sugar Wrinkle in Time. Like, and she told me, she was like, you were always willing to do the grunt work. You kept shooting. Like I was shooting stuff for her. I was shooting things for myself, for other people. And she was like, you just did the thing. And so um, those like five PA years, I grinded them out really hard and I reaped the benefits like super quick in a lot of people's eyes. And some people be like, and I'm like, listen, man, I was out there grinding, you know what I'm saying? And just and, and getting it out the mud and doing the dirty work. So. Um, again, I just, you know, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for somebody like Ava, you know, just putting me in the game and, and believing in me and stuff like that. And so I appreciate that. Though. And Steven? Uh, sleep. And <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, you know, I was, I was sharing this with little Marvin just before we all hopped on. Um, you know, I, when I wrote the first draft of Pose, which was at the tail end of 2013, um, I was doing an assessment. I did an assessment of the television landscape. Um, having spent a decade working in higher education as a college administrator, that was a large part of my job was doing these like campus-wide assessments. So I did one of the television landscape and 
you know, the, what I came out of it with was we don't exist. I don't see myself. Um, and that was the impetus to then write Pose. You know, it was just, I want to write the show that I want to watch. I want to center my communities. Um, so I'm in a place right now coming off of our final season where I'm doing that assessment once again. So I'm keeping my eyes open. I'm watching a lot of television right now um, and refilling the creative well. You know, I wanna be really intentional about what the next project is. You know, I don't wanna just create a show for the sake of creating a show. I wanna make sure that, um, not that I, I only wanna create important television, but I wanna make sure that whatever the next story is that I tell, that it's, that there's a need there, you know, and, and that it's gonna serve a, a purpose. Um, and then outside of that, you know, like Sierra, I'm excited to be in the DGA and I want to direct more. So I'm just looking, yeah. looking for opportunities in both television and features, because I would love to do feature work as well. I mean, Stephanie, uh, direct, I mean, producing the Academy Awards uh, recently, I mean, just what is next? What mountain is there left? to climb my friend well 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 i spent the last year and a half of the pandemic really uh developing and setting things up you know i have a deal at warner brothers for tv i have a deal at endeavor content for film um the next thing is probably we're putting a room together for the vanishing half which is Britt bennett's book which jeremy o'harris and um aziza barnes are show running um, about passing, which is, if you guys haven't read, it's a phenomenal book. Um, but I got some gems that are about to be um, on, on point. I'm super, super excited about. So, and you know, and my movie that I've been trying to do forever is finally coming together, my Shirley Chisholm movie with Denai Guerrera. Um, I've, I've just, you know, as a producer, I feel like if I quit, it's over. You know what I mean? So I'm just constantly just waking up going, what can I do today for this baby? What can I do, you know? Uh, and I'm also producing um, my son, Wade, who's also an Insecure, he's also a writer. He's also a director, just got into the Guild uh, for directing Gronish, which he's been a producer on. Um, but we just set up uh, a feature that he's writing and directing and producing. So that's that second gen, just trying to keep it going. And getting things uh, ginned up for the third gen. Yeah, exactly. Oh yeah, she's already. I got her. I got her ready. She's gonna be music. That's her thing. So, <laughs> and my youngest son is working on sixteen nineteen as an assistant editor. So you know, it just it keeps keep keep it going. Just keep it flowing. Wow, this is terrific. You know what? Tell us how uh, the folks out there can uh, stay connected. Can follow you. Um, sure. I'm at I'm at Stephanie Lane on on Twitter and on um, IG. Sierra. Um, I'm at Sierra Glade on Twitter and Instagram. Um, and that's about all I got because Facebook for my family, really. So you can try to friend me on there. It's not gonna work out. Plus, you're not gonna catch any of my fun adventures. So it's really Twitter and Instagram for me. But yeah, y'all can catch me there. Sierra Glade. Little Marvin. I will never be on Twitter, so you will <laughs> you will only find me on uh, IG at Little Marvin. Stephen, uh, Twitter and Instagram at Stephen Canals, and Patrick, Patrick Ian Polk on both Instagram and Twitter. Terrific, and AAFCA on uh, Twitter and uh, IG. Thank you so much. You guys were fantastic. Uh, this was a, a very, very uh, good conversation. So appreciate Thank it. Thank you, Gail, for all you do. Yes. Thank you, Gail. Thank we you. need more Black critics. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, AFCA TV Honors is August 21st. We awesome. have a great show. In, uh, we'll be watching. For you guys. Yeah. Thanks, watch. everybody. Thank oh, you. Oh, Chris. Thank you, guys. <laughs> well, uh, thank, welcome thank back you. to our wonderful partner, Chris and American Cinematheque. Thank you, Gil. Thank you for leading. And, and, and thank you to all our panelists here. This was such a powerful discussion. I'm so glad we got to do this part two on TV. Uh, and to our audience, you know, this entire discussion is going to be on YouTube. I think more people need to hear this. This needs to live on our YouTube. And uh, please share it around. Um, it, it'll be up in the next coming days. So Yeah, we have a everyone. social card on AAFCA.com. Yeah. Definitely. You guys are all tagged on it. So you know, kick it out there. And I know AC has uh, been very active on Twitter. 
So the last show did real, real well. And so let's beat those numbers from uh, from that broadcast. Let's do it. Let's keep it going. Awesome. <laughs> thank you again. And thank you for everyone, everyone for tuning in. Have a great, have a great day. Y'all take great care. Day.